in the next hour, I want to unpack like what is coming next with fundraising events? Why are people holding on to virtual events? Are donors going to show up? How can you make your donors show up? And also, I want to share a lot of insights that my team and I has, have discovered and walk you through what we've learned as we recently conducted a survey that just talks about the future of fundraising events and how that's going to impact your organization. So to back it up just a little bit, I am Rebecca, as Eli mentioned there. I've had the privilege of working at Trellis for about two and a half years now. And over that time, I've seen a really big shift. At first, I was solely supporting organizations with their in-person events. And then in the last year, transition to solely supporting people with their fundraising and virtual events. And now as we look forward, we're really looking at the combination of both of hybrid events and what does that look like and how is that working for organizations? And today I want to share what I'm learning and what I'm seeing in the virtual world, as well as share some insights that I've seen and I've gained as I've worked with, like I said, hundreds of organizations with their events and their campaigns. To back it up just a little bit more, Trellis is an all-in-one fundraising platform, and so we help foundations, charities, nonprofits with all of their fundraising, virtually, in person, and everything in between. So across North America, supporting ticketing and donations, silent and live auctions, raffles, live streaming, the whole piece. But beyond being a technology platform, we want to also help the organizations we work with. We want to be industry experts and leaders and share new ideas and new ways to increase fundraising success. And that's really where this whole talk and this whole idea came from. My team and I sat down and we realized that we just don't know what's coming next in the fundraising world. And if we're feeling like that, we know that you guys are feeling the same way too. And so we've conducted a survey and a research report uh, to just better understand the future of fundraising events. We talked to hundreds of charities, industry experts, and donors to understand where they see the future going, how they've been impacted so far, and kind of what their next steps are. We've also taken a look at hundreds of fundraising events that have happened, really reviewed them to see what are some common trends we're seeing, what's working, and also what's not working, so that we can help organizations like you guys move forward in the right way. So right now I want to dive into, yeah, like what was events as we know it, like what happened to them and kind of where do things sit now? Talking about the present, the rise of virtual events, what does that look like and, and what can we get excited about? And then thinking future forward, raising more with in-person hybrid or virtual events, what does that look like and what can you do to succeed with those? All of the information that I'm sharing is actually put together in a report. And so I highly recommend you guys all download it. There is a QR code right there. So you can scan it on your phone uh, to pull up the QR code and you can um, access it there. I will bring up that QR code at the end though too. So it is not gone forever. But before we dive too far in and before I start talking away, I would love to know a little bit more about who's in the room. And I want to ask a quick poll question to see, yeah, what, what kind of, where are you guys sitting with your fundraising now, right now and what does that look like? So you can go to that link right there, menti.com and use that eight digit code and throw it in there or super easy. Again, you can scan that QR code. So just pull out your phone and do that. The question I want to know is what type of events are you planning for 2021? So a couple different options there and you can select uh, which ones or which few kind of apply to you guys. Lots of virtual, lots of hybrid. We've got a couple in person and a couple people unsure. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, 2021, the virtual model at this point is what we're seeing to be the most popular because like you guys, we just don't know what's coming next. But I like seeing that some of you guys are thinking hybrid and as restrictions change and as we get used to what's coming next, uh, the opportunities to do hybrid on a small scale in person or and then like a larger virtual option are really exciting. That's awesome. Sweet. Okay. This is really similar to what we've been seeing so far. So I'm glad to hear that you guys are kind of sitting in the same place. And I see some more coming in for hybrid. Awesome. So the event end of events as we know it. To start our research, we looked at what has happened in the past. In 2020, 40% of our surveyed organizations hit their fundraising goals. And actually, given how quick and adaptable they had to be, we're actually really impressed by that number. But there's a couple things we noticed. One, the organizations that hit their goals pivoted to virtual events. 
They were agile, efficient, uh, and they took the plunge to make sure they could still engage with their donors even when the world went online. And if you guys want, the chat is open. So throw in there, like, did you guys go virtual? Did you do anything in 2020? What did that look like for you guys? The second thing we noticed is the organizations that their fundraising goals, they took responsibility for their own success. They had sufficient marketing and communication around their events. They utilized an expanded geographical reach so that they could increase how many people were at their event. And they also spent a lot of time testing and practicing to ensure that there was a really smooth donor experience. Moving to virtual after years and years of doing in-person events is not easy. And the donor experience that we've spent so long perfecting and crafting for an in-person event, everything from the moments people walk into the building to they sit down at their table and then they leave at the end of the night, you guys have thought about it and you've planned it. So making that switch and ensuring a consistent donor experience from start to finish when you're virtual looks different, but the organizations that hit their goals, they did that. They thought about that and really identified what does that look like. And that was also noticed by our donors. And we actually talked to our donors about this too. And they said, while most of them do enjoy participating in a virtual event, they actually loved being able to do something virtual as well. It was more affordable and they could participate from the comfort at home. And they loved being able to easily access the silent auction or the different fundraising elements and they could actively check in on it or monitor it as things were happening. Making donations on a credit card was really attractive to our donors when they looked at virtual events. And then also the ability to see speakers that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to see. And having an increased and more diverse group of speakers and entertainers was really attractive. Our survey also realized that donors contributed just as much, if not more, virtually. So for our organizations, the impact of that was so significant and honestly, such a great benefit. I want to throw another question out into the survey. I'm actually going to throw two out at one time here. But we know that virtual events were a key to succeed in 2020. I mean, I just, just shared 40% of organizations did it well. But I want to know what you guys think about where the industry is headed and what type of events will allow us to keep moving forward and hitting our goals. So I might need to open this up so you guys can start filling that out. So do you think virtual events will outlive the pandemic? And then will in-person events have their moment post-pandemic as well? We're seeing some yeses, some definitelys on there. I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes to throw some more answers in there. Yeah, it's funny. I think the the idea of a virtual event post pandemic at first glance, I'll be honest, doesn't sound that appealing. Like I've just spent the last year and a half on Zoom, but I mean, the results and what I'll share it here in a second too, like people are able to engage with their donors in different ways and they're able to raise more money with their donors virtually. And it, it just opens up so many doors. So I'm excited about that. But on the flip side, yeah, in-person events having a, their moment post pandemic, I mean, I think we're either torn. Half of us are dying to get out of our house and see people and see their smiles in real life. And other others of us are kind of happy. So uh, we're kind of happy being at home. So I think, yeah, it's it's such a toss up. But I think the, the in-person event will have its comeback. And I think a lot of organizations I'm talking to right now are really excited about that too. Awesome. So first, let's just dive into the virtual event and then afterwards, let's go into specifically into in-person and kind of what that looks like. But really similar to what we just saw as you guys were all putting in your numbers there too, our survey results show that 92% of charity professionals and industry experts believe virtual events are worth keeping after the pandemic. It's really consistent with what you guys just said. And they listed some of their top reasons why they think that's the case. First, cost and time saved. On average, charities spent half the time planning and executing their events and half of their usual in-person budget. Yes, there is different expenses, but mapping everything out all together, it actually ended up being a lot cheaper. Ease of execution. Virtual events are now just a new, er, a new tool in the charity toolbox. Uh, virtual events take less time and money and can easily be produced in addition to other yearly events. A uh, little sneak peek, let's dive into that a little bit further as you get towards the end of this presentation here. Beyond that, increased geographical range, we're no longer bound to, even like this, we're not just bound to people in Lower Mainland, we've got people all over the world joining us today. Cheaper for donors, 
Lower costs for charities meant that they could actually increase potential donor reach, but the end net amount that they raised still ended up being the same as a result. Less manpower required. Imagine Canada did a study and saw that one third of charities in Canada had seen a reduction in staff due to layoffs. And with virtual events, we actually don't require the same level of staff and volunteers to execute. And so organizations were still able to go forward with them regardless of those changes. And then virtual event uh, fundraising elements. On average, organizations that included three or more fundraising elements doubled the amount that they raised compared to organizations that did two or less fundraising components. And the ability to create um, those opportunities for your donors to contribute, even if they're not in the room or they're not uh, participating in the event, allows you to go a lot further with how much you're able to raise. So we can see that virtual events and organizations that took the plunge to do a virtual event in 2021 succeeded. And we know that virtual events are here to stay. I mean, you guys said what, 8.9% or 89% of you said yes. Our other study said 92, so very comparable numbers. And we're seeing that there is advantages that our donors are recognizing as well as our charities. But the next question is, is how can we maximize our fundraising potential when we're doing a virtual event? And what insights can we pull from organizations that raise more or less? And what are some key takeaways that you guys can use to now implement in your organizations as you approach the hybrid and the virtual events you guys just said you have coming up? So first, I wanted to take a look at what we can learn from organizations that didn't hit their fundraising goals or actually raised less by moving to virtual. The first, they made the switch to virtual really last minute. Given the urgency and the challenges that we saw in the first times that we saw with 2020, this is honestly so understandable. But not giving yourself enough time to plan an event if it's virtual can be really detrimental to hitting your fundraising goals. Next thing, they removed a crucial fundraising element. So maybe you've always done a live auction in person, but you pulled the plug for your virtual event. Even when planning your virtual events, it's important to make strategic decisions and considerations around what are going to be the best approaches to moving forward with your event and hitting your fundraising goals. And in the report, too, we actually talk a lot about around what are the fundraising elements that are most popular and most effective for virtual fundraisers from the perspective of our donors that we surveyed, as well as the organizations we talked to. Number three, they feel that their donors were less engaged. So survey donors have told us that event programming and entertainment is like one of the key reasons that they attend an event. So think about that. Like, what can you do to engage your donors? It's a virtual setting. So what are you going to do to make sure that they stay attended and they stay focused throughout the entire event? Have they felt like they didn't have sufficient marketing? Yeah, definitely switching to virtual. It's important to think about your new marketing streams. What are you doing and what's working for you? We have seen organizations use networker or influencer marketing, uh, newsletter and social media with the most success over the last year. And then lastly, less people attended or it was easier to leave. So give them a reason to stay. That's actually totally in your guys' hands. What are you doing to engage them? What's making it really exciting? What's worth sticking around till the very end for? These five challenges that we saw, they don't actually exist any, anymore. They're all things that we can be proactive about as we think about our events and as we move forward with them. And it also gives us some more opportunities to think about what can we do to not just hit our goals but now surpass them. And so that was actually the next thing we did too, is we took a look at what are organizations that are raising more doing? And we came up with kind of our, our top three. This list is a lot longer, but these were kind of the three that continued to surface for us. So number one, the event is now going to be a bit more accessible financially. So you've got a bigger reach. So we're seeing organizations try lots of things from trying a lower ticket price to give more opportunities to give and donate throughout the event or having a higher ticket price, but more value based. So you get a meal, you get all these different elements with it. So think about that for your organization. We now have the ability to expand our donor base. What does that look like and how do you engage them? Number two, no location barriers for your, for your virtual event. This one 
it's really important to think about how you can capitalize on this. So we can now have donors and participants engaged that aren't in your city or in your town. And so how and what are you going to do to make sure that out of town guests feel welcome? What are you going to do so out of town guests know about your event and may tune in or may want to watch and participate? And then number three, reduce costs compared to in-person events. The reduced costs do mean more space to raise more, but I also want you to think about what does that look like and how can you actually invest those funds differently so that you can give your donors a better experience because a better experience will in turn lead to more money raised at the end of the day. Some other quick ideas I just wanted to mention. Like I said, we've supported over 100 of organizations in the past year and a half as we've navigated COVID. And from virtual, in-person, and hybrid, these are some ideas that really help other organizations hit their goals. And so I want to just throw them your way as well. But while I'm sharing this, if you guys have other ideas of what's worked for you, or if there's been something that you've really enjoyed, throw it in the chat as well. And I would love to love to hear from you as well. But the first is uh, create an event campaign. So introduce and use different elements to engage your different donor types leading up to the event raffles, silent auctions, a live auction and a fund a need on the day of maybe. Give your donors different and more avenues to participate in your cause. It just creates more energy and it just improves your donor experience. Maybe I can't afford to bid on a live auction item, but you've got a raffle or a 50-50 and so I can put in a hundred bucks there instead. Maybe somebody else is more excited in the live auction rather than the chance to win in the 50-50, but we can both be engaged and we can both be really excited about what you guys have planned when we have a broader, broader options of how we can give. The second one is start marketing and your outreach early. Don't leave this to the last minute and get really creative around how you get the word out. Younger donors are all over social media, but like, don't forget about your newsletters, your website, promoting your event at other events you're leading up to it. Whatever you can do to get the word out and continue to remind people that your event's coming up, the better chance that they have in actually attending. And number three, invest in the experience. So I've mentioned this a couple times, but it's honestly so key. Give your donors something to talk about with their colleagues on Monday morning. And I think if you guys had that as your goal, as you're planning your event and as you're planning the entertainment, it would probably be a really great place to start. Um, a virtual bartender that can keep uh, your attendees topped up throughout the event. Maybe you try a virtual cooking class or a virtual wine tasting or dance class. Oftentimes, you're going to have your prospective donors attending the event before they make an investment in your cause. So seamlessly mixing those heartwarming moments and stories and awareness about your cause with some really engaging and entertaining elements throughout the night is going to do you guys such a great service and helping to build more excitement around what you're doing. So I want to jump back actually to our live survey results and take a look at what we said for in-person events. So in here, we said, yeah, 89% of us said that in-person events will have their moment post-pandemic as well. And again, just like the, the above point, when we did this survey with our industry experts, donors, and charities, they said 93% of them agreed that in-person events are definitely worth going back to when it's safe to do so. In our survey, we also talked to Lane, the auctionista. They're an amazing auctioneer in Canada here. And so if you guys are yeah, ever interested, yeah, definitely somebody great to talk to you about auctioneers for your events. But they said that there will be charities whose donor bases will crave in person. And in person is not going to look the same, but now needs to be reinvented. And we honestly love that how we engage with our donors moving forward will change. But we're going to jump more into this into in just a minute. First, I want to go back to why are organizations excited to move forward with in-person events? So the first is pressure from their donors. Donors are keen to get back into the room and are asking the organizations they, su they support to prioritize this as soon as they can. We're also seeing the other side of pressure, which is donors are encouraging impression positively pressuring, if I can say, others to give. They're spurring each other on, and that spirit and excitement in a virtual in a virtual event is just harder to capture. So people are so excited to get back into the room to have that pressure and that excitement happening again. Second is engagement. So engagement with donors and attendees looks different when we're when we're online. We all know that. We all feel that. I mean, this conversation would look really different if we were in the same room right now. 
Connections with donors. The ability to make meaningful connections with donors has also shifted and it's become more challenging with virtual events. You know, I can have a different conversation when I'm in person with somebody than I may have over chat or over a Zoom call. Not to say they're not great, but it just looks really different. And then networking. Donors and organizations alike are both looking forward to being able to network when we're back in person. And again, totally different experience as you guys know. So thinking about virtual, thinking about in person, the question comes at the end of the day, who will win and which direction are we taking with fundraising events? And so as the world continues to change, so will the popularity between virtual and in-person events. I mean, 16 of you guys said that you've got a virtual event planned. 14 of you said you've got a hybrid this year. Two years from now, will those numbers look the same? I don't know, but the focus on those ones will, will begin to shift. For 2021 and 2022, virtual events will win. So let's just embrace it. Hybrid events will also be grouped into that and they will continue to win. And in 2021, the survey that we conducted told us that organizations, again, like you guys, are hosting 30% more virtual events than they have in the past. But beyond that, we're also seeing fundraising elements like silent auctions, ticketing and donations, fund and needs will continue to shift and remain online for an easier donor and charity experience. So the idea of doing a virtual silent auction or selling tickets online or handling online donations actually still exists. And we realize that people love it and we're not gonna lose that moving forward. So that takes us to what we're calling the new kid on the block. It's in-person events with your virtual fundraising elements. This honestly gives us the best of both worlds as we host events like we have in the past but also hold on to the best parts of virtual fundraising, which is the actual fundraising and the raising money pieces. So let's take a look at the different benefits that we've just discussed for virtual events, as well as in-person events. For virtual, affordability for donors, virtual fundraising elements, diverse speakers and entertainment, and an increased reach geographically as more people can participate from anywhere. On the other side, we said for in-person events, pleasing our donors and looking forward to don in-person events, increased engagement, more opportunities for meaningful donor connection, and the ability to network with donors and attendees once again. When we think about that new idea I just mentioned of in-person events with virtual fundraising elements, we can actually capitalize on all of this. Affordability, online fundraising elements, speakers and entertainers of different caliber or locations, and increased donor geographical reach, and we meet our donor requests. We engage, we connect, and we network with our attendees like we have in the past. So there's a couple different ways that we can approach it. And I wanted to kind of map out like what do these events actually look like and walk you through some ideas. Cause I mentioned to a couple of you guys at the beginning, I wanna give you some actual ideas that you can walk away with. So you feel really confident about what your modern fundraising events look like. If that's 2022, 2021 or beyond that as well. So here I've kind of put on a scale a couple of different options. You'll notice that all by itself, we've got the in-person pen and paper event. That event is done. The idea of doing a silent auction on a piece of paper kind of makes me cringe because it just feels like so much work. And so that's done and it shouldn't come back if I'm allowed to say that. But these other four ideas will allow you to engage with your donors at different levels on a virtual and in-person scale. So the first one, in-person with virtual fundraising. Let's dive into that first. This is what it could look like. It's your virtual fundraising elements, your silent auction, like you can see on the right side of my screen there. You've got your ticketing online, donations online. Maybe you even do your live auction online, the bidding for it online while people are all sitting in the same room. But you've still got the in-person connection and engagement. And you've got ease of donor partici participation leading up to the event. One of the things that our donors mentioned up at the top about virtual events is that they loved that they can monitor the silent auction. With something like this, yeah, it's still an in-person event, but they can still monitor that silent auction for the two weeks leading up to the event and get really excited about it before the event actually happens. Same thing, maybe I've got some raffle tickets that I can buy leading up to the event to give me a better chance of winning some awesome prizes during my in-person event. The next is gonna be in-person with a small live stream audience. So this picture on the side here, you can see you've got an audience of people in front and we've got a projector and a big 
kind of screen up there. So for this type of an event, maybe I'm just sitting behind these people. I can see their heads in the background, but I've just got my camera on there for a live stream audience to also participate in. Maybe for this one, you've got 10% of your attendees participating virtually and the rest are all in person. So you actually host your in-person event just like you have in the past. But now that we have that camera there, we can still increase our geographical reach. What I love about this is, again, ease of donor participation leading up to the event. People can go in, they can participate. And as well, on the day of the event, your attendees that are in person, but also watching remotely, can all participate together. We can all bid on the same silent auction items. We can all put money into the same raffle or make donations or give through a fund and need moment at the same time. But we still hold on to that ability to, uh, for in-person engagement and connection and we get to appeal to a wider donor base. The next one is a virtual event with a VIP in-person audience. So now we're doing a bit of a flip. Instead of having 10% of our attendees virtual, maybe we have closer to 60 or 70% virtual with an in-person VIP experience for a certain number of guests. What I love about this is again, we've got that increased geographical reach. We've got an, we're appealing to a wider donor base. We've got a great donor experience, and that probably looks a little bit custom for our in-person VIP guests, as well as something a bit custom for our um, at-home attendees as well. And again, for our guests that are in-person, we've got connection and networking opportunities with our guests. But like you can see in this picture, it's not just a big uh, stage and one camera that's pointing at it. Now it's a bit more tailored. It's a bit more catered to the people that could be watching from home, because it could actually make up a really large number for you. And then lastly, it's our purely virtual event. So just like we've already talked about, a lot of those benefits are still gonna exist. Cost and time saved, ease of execution, increased geographical raise, reach, sorry, cost savings to donors, as well as less manpower required to support them. And as you can see here, it's a totally virtual experience. I can see my host or my auctioneer talking. I can see a live auction and I can see bidding history coming up. As well, I can see a chat so people can participate that way too. So last things I want to leave you guys with are like, what does it take to actually succeed? This is a new format. So how does it work and how can you actually hold your events to make sure that it's a success on your end? First is creating a seamless donor experience. Using the approaches we just talked about, make your donor experience stand out. Before the event, make it easy and make it fun for them. Have tickets, raffle tickets, and silent auctions online. On the day of the event, encourage people to use the chat if we're virtual, or donate and bid as the event's actually happening. And make it easy for people that are also engaging with their friends in the room. Think about the different elements and the different components of your event. What does it look like if I'm experiencing it while I'm in the room? Or what does it look like as I experience it from my home? Think about how that works and think about what kind of elements or, or key moments you really want to highlight. And the next piece, just like we just talked about, so give your donors options to participate in person or virtually depending on their preferences. And number three, increase the amount of fundraising elements you include to appeal to an entire audience. I said this a couple of times before, but you know, maybe as a donor, I can't afford to give to some higher priced items, but a small donation or a small raffle ticket actually is something I can afford to do. And at the end of the day, it does all add up. Remember that what you are doing is actually a fundraising event. So it is okay to ask your donors to give, but when you do it, make it easy and make it simple so that they actually feel like they can give rather than um, having to jump through a whole ton of loops. So, as we're wrapping up here, and I, like I said, we're gonna open up this, the floor to some questions here too, because I really wanna hear what you guys are thinking, but where do we go from here? I just shared a ton of information right now. So the first thing you wanna, you're gonna to wanna to do is pull out your phone again and scan that QR code and download the report that I just mentioned, because it does dive really deep into some of these findings, as well shares a little bit more insights, especially around the donor side, around what does it look like, what are donors liking, or what are some things that we wanna to shift towards moving and then you're going to want to ask yourself some questions. What have I done in the past that's really worked? What do I want to keep? What do I want to improve? Or what do we know we want to bring back? On the flip side, what do we know we don't want to bring back? What are some things that we know we can, that we can change? I'd also encourage you, just like we did, don't be afraid to talk to your donors about it. Ask them that, what they want to see. Ask them what they're excited about to kind of gain some of their insights. 
And then think about how you can create an inclusive experience with plenty of ways to give for all of your donors, regardless of who they are. And then lastly, I would just encourage you to check out some of the resources that my, me and my team have put together. The report is a great first one, but another great resource. If you actually just go to our website here and I believe there's somebody, one or two of the people from my team are also on this call. So if they want to just throw it in the chat. But if you just go to our website, we've got a whole section on fundraising resources. These are free for anybody to use. So you can just come here and check them out. The report that I mentioned, you can access it here as well. We've got all sorts of resources from golf tournaments to virtual events, some recorded webinars that you can check out at any time. Again, all of these tools really just here to kind of help you make sure that you can raise more for your organization and also just learn more about where to start or what that looks like. So what we know is 89% of donors expect to attend a virtual event in 2021. 76% are expecting to attend one in 2022 as well. So think about those numbers. Think about what you can do to meet your donors exactly where they are. I'm going to leave it there. I know Eli's back up here, so we'd love to open the floor up to questions, but download the report. I've got the list of kind of our four fundraising events that you guys can move forward with, just kind of keep in the back of your mind. And I would love to answer some questions here. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing the best practices and the results of the report. Your colleague, Emily, has of course been super active in the chat, knocking down questions, bang, bang, bang. So a lot of the platform specific questions are being addressed right there. Amazing. But yeah, I would encourage everyone, will we have this moment to sort of add some more questions into the chat right now? But let me start that off with one question to buy you all some time. So we all agree that hybrid events likely are the future, but I think not just really have a great sense of what that could look like. And I'm wondering if you maybe are able to share a good example of an organization that has done a hybrid event that you thought worked well and what, what made it, made it have worked well. Cause I think we've all sort of tried the, oh, there's a live stream camera in the back of the room. And then we just ignore that those people exist. So that didn't work when I tried it in the past. Can you share some ideas around that? Yeah, definitely. So thinking about that and what you mentioned there, Eli, is kind of like the number two here, right? If we look at this as a sliding scale of, like you said, we've got an in-person crowd that we're obviously they're right in front of us. So that's kind of our top priority, but we've got the camera in the back and hopefully the audio is okay. And hopefully they can see the slides. But I have seen some organizations do a really good job with the number three here, kind of like the number three in our scale of the virtual event with a VIP in-person audience. So what I've seen people do is at the beginning of an event, if you're just walking into an in-person event, and if we all kind of go there mentally right now, you walk in, there's registration, maybe there's a band playing, maybe there's, yeah, some pictures or some logos on, the, on, on a screen for our sponsors, we can see them. While that's happening, if I'm sitting at home, I don't really need to watch people move, but what I could have is maybe a custom video that just, it's a pre-recorded video, it highlights the organization, talks about some exciting things that they've got going on. As the event progresses, everybody's up and they're grabbing drinks from the bartender. So maybe we have another pre-recorded video just for our attendees at home, where it's that virtual bartender that comes up, that gives people some drink suggestion. During the actual event, maybe we've got our MC or our host talking now, and we actually have some of our volunteer team or our staff team actually go out and do a house delivery to somebody that's watching virtually. We pull it up on the big screen. So now the people in the person get to experience what it's like to be a virtual attendee as well. So thinking about things like that, like what does that look like? How can you kind of combine those two pieces is what I've seen be really successful. Love that idea of the live de delivery and like sort of bringing that live footage in. I think it, yeah, it brings like a real moment where people are like, oh, I got to watch this now because it's it's happening, it's real. And it brings the two experiences together. I, I also have seen people have really great success with VIP experiences because it's a way for you to segment out your audience too. Because some people actually want to pay more than your gala ticket price. Yeah. And this is one way to allow them to opt into that opportunity. Yeah. 
Definitely. And yeah, you're right. Sometimes those VIP in-person tickets are like 600 bucks. And for some of us, that's great. And we're happy to do that. And others of us, we can't actually afford to do that as often. So a $20 ticket where I can have that experience at home, it's kind of like watching the Oscars. I don't pay to be there, but I get to see the action as it's kind of happening. So I've got another question coming in from Lori, and it's a more general fundraising question around mm -hmm. online fundraising raffles. What is like the current licensing regime here in British Columbia like to get involved with that? Do you have a good sense of that? Yeah, great question. So you would go through BC Gaming. They've got a licensing group there and every single province and state will have it. I don't know if we I didn't see any US attendees today, but any province or state would have them. And so you would work with them to get your license. In BC, I know there's four different types, so depending on how much you want to raise. And then you're going to work with a platform that is a verified raffle provider. So they're going to be able to support you, make sure that, yeah, you can sell tickets, you know, help you create those custom tickets and do all of that piece. And so very small trellis plug, we're actually so close in our process to become a verified raffle provider. And so Lori, if you have questions around how that works, I'm happy to send along some more resources. I think Emily threw my email in there and we'll make sure that you guys all have my contact details or it's on the slide too. So you can reach out to me directly and we can chat about it. Lovely. And I've got a comment here coming in from Dave Frank, who says the license is not that expensive, but the paperwork is brutal. So start early because it will take some time to work its way through the system. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I know. I feel like they try and make it hard for us sometimes with those gaming licenses and applications, but they are fun when they're up and running for sure. Excellent. Yeah, we had another question here coming in from Wendy, who's wondering if the Trellis platform could work for an event that's not so focused on fundraising, but is more of sort of an expo with virtual booths where people could come and like have sort of a more educational experience. Could it be adapted in that way? Yeah, we have seen some people do our, use our platform for like a marketplace kind of idea so you can learn about different organizations. We are primarily a fundraising platform, and so the features that we have, Wendy, are really tailored towards that. And I think Emily mentioned in there, like we don't offer like the booth experience in the same way, but yeah, we definitely, and again, feel free to shoot me an email. I would love to, to send you some examples of what we've seen other people do to do more of like an awareness campaign or, or share details around a handful of organizations. Lovely. And I'm seeing here in the chat, we've got a lonely American Pam here, who's wondering if anyone else can help brainstorm some good recommendations for like online raffle services in the US. So uh, if others want to jump into the chat, you're welcome to go in there, but I won't put poor Rebecca on the spot. It seems cruel. And who was that? Was that? Um, Coming in from Pam Green. From Pam. Pam, I actually have supported a handful of US raffles as well. So I may be able to help or at least help point you in, in some directions. So again, feel free to shoot me an email and, and happy to chat that way too. I'm happy to get on the phone to talk about some ideas as well with any of you. Well, we've just filled up your dance card, Rebecca, um, and I will make sure your contact information is included in the post event email as well, as well as the video as well. So you can, everyone can come back and capture some of the insights that you captured in your slide and from the room. That sounds great. So what do you think, friends? We probably have time for one or two more questions. So this is your moment to drop something in the chat. Otherwise, well, those final things are coming in. This is where I should do a little bit of my own, like, tooting of the horn. So uh, let me turn on the screen share and I'll show you what's going mm -hmm. on over here. If I could take over from you. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you. So we are doing these events often. Our next event is scheduled for September, although one or two might sneak in through the summer as well. But next it, on our dance card here is on September 14th, we are going to be tackling Google Analytics for nonprofits. And in Google Analytics is important, mostly free, and huge and terrifying. So we're going to ignore most of it. And we're going to focus up on only the most important 25% that you actually need to pay attention to, to you know, really figure out what's happening and how you can market more successfully within your nonprofit. So uh, if you haven't yet, come and join us and register for the event. It'll be noon on September 14th, and you can find it again at events.techsoup.org. So super excited to see you there for that next event as well. All right, let's see. Did anything else pop into the chat? Scrolling, 
So uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. So one is a question coming in from Ron, who's saying, when will the recording be available? And the answer is, I should definitely have it out for you by Friday at the very latest. And everyone who registered for this event will receive an email with that link. So you, we'll make sure that you see that. I've also got a question here from Adi, which is like, does Trellis offer like a watch party option or some way for people to have that kind of interactive experience? Yeah, we don't have a, and it looks like Emily's responding at the same time. Uh, so you can run a live streamed event through our platform. So you can have actually really similar to this, where you can see your speakers, you have the chat going. And so that's how a lot of people are making it really engaging. We do, and we have seen some organizations host a bit more of a watch party. It comes a little bit more complex because oftentimes you'll use something like a Google Hangouts at the same time so you can watch the event with your friends virtually. But what we're seeing is the chat tends to be a really great way to, to engage the, uh, your audience for a virtual event. And, and the chat feature similar to this would work the same way on the Trellis platform. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. Such a pleasure.